Hi, I'm Dr. Jack West. I'm Associate Clinical Professor in Medical Oncology at the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center and also the founder and president of GRACE, Global Resource for Advancing Cancer Education. I'm very happy to be joined today for an ASCO Highlights presentation in the field of lung cancer with two of my friends and colleagues from other parts of the country who are lung cancer experts with uh, some different perspectives and we're going to go through some of the key presentations and uh, talk about what we think this means for patients. Uh, so uh, first I have uh, Dr. Helena Yu, who is a medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and Dr. David Spiegel, who is chief scientific officer and director of the lung cancer program at the Sarah Cannon Cancer Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Thanks guys for joining. It's been a very busy spring in 2020 in terms of new FDA approvals. And one of them was for a new agent against the target of MET, specifically MET exon 14 mutations, which are in about two to 4% of patients with non-small cell lung cancer. This agent, Capmatinib, it now has the marketed name Tabrecta, and we knew it had good activity. We saw a little more data at ASCO 2020, uh, looking at uh, cohorts of patients who got it either as a second or third line treatment and a smaller group on the right in the orange table who got it as first line treatment. And this is just more information that tells us what we already concluded, which is that this is a very active drug for uh, patients with this target if you identify it. You can also see that the response rates are clearly higher if these agents are given in the first line setting versus later. And uh, so this is uh, the data with capmatinib. And uh, you can also see that it induces good deep responses. And uh, you can see part of the brain MRI of one patient is just really highlighting that many of these targeted therapies have good activity in the brain, both treating brain metastases that exist and also in uh, usually or hopefully pre preventing new brain metastases from developing in these patients. Uh, I put, uh, it's a different target, but a similar category. The drug pralcetinib uh, is uh, from Blueprint Medicines, known as Blue 667 uh, as well. Uh, this also had new data presented by Justin Gaynor from uh, Mass General, and we saw very good responses uh, for patients with a RET fusion. This agent is not FDA approved, but there is another agent in uh, this category targeting RET fusion called selpercatinib uh, with very similar data. And here you can see response rates of about 60% and nearly every patient with at least uh, disease control. And then shrinkage of brain metastases here on the right, I'm sorry, on the left, you can see a so-called spider plot where downward trend over from left to right represents shrinking tumor. And there weren't a lot of patients to speak to, but seven of the nine patients who had measurable brain metastases had tumor shrinkage on this. And so, these agents are now FDA, uh, increasingly FDA approved pralcetinib, hopefully soon, but we already have another one for red fusion. And uh, it's exciting work. It's a, a new opportunity for a small population. I would say one of the challenges though, is that you're never gonna find it if you don't go looking for it. This is not, and these are the six, seventh targets in a list. And so uh, I think that the only way that people are going to find these is if they do next generation sequencing, broad molecular testing, not one by one by one testing of a couple or three choice targets. Uh, Helena, can you talk about, a lot of this work's been done actually at Memorial. So uh, can, you, can you talk about uh, how transformative this is or how limiting it is if, you know, in terms of the challenges of next generation sequencing not being done necessarily in a timely way uh, on a broad setting yet. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that, as you mentioned, Jack, I think as we, you know, we're almost in the double digits with FDA approved um, drugs for these different targets, um, you'll never find something if you don't look for it. And I think if, if at all possible, I think with these really um, sort of incredible response rates and durations of response, if we can give these first line, um, we really should try to give them first line. Um, as we know, with metastatic disease, some people don't get to second line and later treatment. So it's just so important to use um, the first treatment, the best treatment first, excuse me. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the faster we get with um, next generation sequencing, if we can, um, you know, have the results within two weeks or if they get sent off earlier, um, that will be really helpful for our patients. David, anything to add or do you know, you are working kind of on the interface. You have a pretty academic practice doing a ton of research, but you also work in a broader, you know, community uh, uh, setting uh, for, for a lot of this research. How much or how little of a barrier is this need for next gen sequencing to find these? Well, I, I mean, not much to add because I think the stories are so compelling. You know, these drugs are so effective, so active. You know, you go back to Trek even. I, I think people, community oncologists are recognizing that you're only going to find these if you test broadly and, and you just kind of get into a habit of doing it. And, you know, it's not, it's not just this, right? I mean, there's TMB just got to be an approved strategy to use immunotherapy, what, last week? Um, we talked about HER2. We didn't even talk about RAF and ROS and ALK and EGFR to any great extent. But there's so many things we need to look for. You know, broadly testing makes sense. And, and so what we're seeing in our in our network are are physicians talking more with their patients about this, and then and then trying to find the best way to do that for them. And often it ends up being either sending tissue off to an outside. Uh, laboratory to do that analysis or and or blood to get back at least a snapshot of some of those potential genetic alterations. So the main thing is, can you move somebody from not doing any testing to testing? And the answer is yes, it's happening every day now. And then trying to help them understand what those results mean and then how to use that to apply to a treatment. This kind of discovery, let's say you're a patient tomorrow, a doctor tomorrow with a patient that might be your only patient with this kind of alteration for a year or two in the community. And so having experience is not going to be, you know, be easy for, pay, for, for physicians. So this is going to be something that is going to take a lot of education and communication. But I also think that, fortunately, it's a setting where, you know, if you have a patient who you're doing NGS on everybody, if you find someone who's met positive and you give capmatinib and, and get a very good sustained response, that not only is going to inspire you to keep looking for MET, but yeah, it'll right. cross over to the same concept applies for RET and TREK and everything else. It's just, it doesn't, right. it's the same process and the, the, the same both testing process and thought process that applies from EGFR and ALK and ROS that we've been doing for a decade or more to these newer ones. It just, once you get beyond five and certainly approaching 10 or more targets, it only makes it more screamingly compelling. And I think now it's fully, the, the, the scales have fully tipped to one side. And hopefully at this point, it will be compelling enough that just about everyone will decide we need to do whatever it takes to get this broad testing done.